Hello overclockers, my name's Eight Peck, King Overclocker, Professional Overclocker, and the Don Calione of YouTube. In this video, I'm going to be reviewing the 9800X3D CPU by AMD. And what I'm going to cover is the stock performance of the CPU, giving the thermals and the power draw, and also some frequency overclocking, PBO overclocking, and memory, memory overclocking and tuning. Obviously, this video is about one week later than the rest, but you've watched the rest and wasted your time probably, but now you're gonna watch the best. So, all that being said, let's watch the best 9800XCD review. Let's now cover a little bit about the CPU. AMD split the launch of the 9000 series. And this particular CPU, the 9800X3D, is aimed squarely at the gamers. But to be honest, they've also improved multi-threaded loads from the previous generation too. This CPU's architecture is Granite Ridge Zen 5. It has eight cores and 16 threads, which is the same as the 7800X3D from the previous generation. The base clock on this CPU is 4.7 GHz, with a boost clock on one core of 5.2 GHz. In fact, I actually found in some testing that the boost clock on one core can be up to 5.4 GHz, which is a bit of a bonus of a stock. This particular CPU has several architectural improvements over the previous generation. Rather than adding on the extra L3 cache above the CCD, AMD has put it underneath this type helping to keep thermals down and clock speeds up, also allowing for overclocking. Now on the previous generation, the only type of overclocking you could do was of PBO2 nature. This time, the entire CPU is overclocked for fun, or can be overclocked for more fun. This CPU fits exactly the same as the previous CPU into any AM5 motherboard uh, with the latest BIOS. Uh, and these AM5 motherboards currently available on the market and to come in the future will all be supported up to 2027. So, what was my test system for this 9800X3D? For the majority of this testing, I used the MSI motherboard here on the desk next to me. Uh, this is the X870E Carbon Wi-Fi board, which I found reasonably solid, in fact, totally stable throughout my testing for both stock, overclocked, and memory tuning, uh, which was really good. Uh, the BIOS was fairly intuitive to use, and to be honest, I had really no problem with this board whatsoever from a technical point of view. Uh, from a looks point of view, you'll see here, it matches really well with the G-Skill memory that I use for quite a lot of the testing, and it also matched really well with the Corsair memory uh, that I use for my stock testing in terms of look. And also this board would obviously fit well in terms of look in any uh, black colored or black theme system or also any monochrome system. So well done for to MSI for this board. Uh, like I said, I really enjoyed it and had no problems getting it to work with pretty much anything I tried to do. And it didn't take me a lot of time to get it to work either, which is great. So obviously, before I start testing on the board, I did flash it to the latest BIOS, which has the latest Agisa code in it, which takes advantage of all the latest patches on Windows. Now, talking about Windows, I had that installed on a WD850X drive, which I always use. And like I said, I did update that to the latest version, and I updated all the AMD chipset drivers accordingly as well. At the same time, I updated my NVIDIA driver suite as well for the GPU that I was using, which is the usual GPU, the 4090, that I always use. Again, set at stock with stock driver settings. For my testing at stock uh, and at PBO2 and initial overclocking, I used uh, 5200 MHz Corsair memory, uh, completely set at the XMP mode. And then finally, uh, for my final money shot, if you like, bit of to get the most performance out of the CPU, kind of overclocking. I use the G-Skill 6000 megahertz memory with XMP uh, or XPO enabled, yes, but almost all of the sub-timings and even the primary timings uh, were also tuned to really try and extract more uh, from the memory bandwidth. Finally, the cooling that I used for this CPU uh, was only a 240mm Acer Tech cooler. Now, normally, as everyone will know, I'm usually reviewing higher-end CPUs which put out a lot more heat. 
Uh, this CPU, of course, you puts out a lot less heat as a lower TDP, and I thought to, to make sure it would uh, test like it was going into a smaller case or a lower powered system, I'd be better to choose a 240mm AIO, and I did that and I placed on uh, two EK fans onto that AIO. So, under stock conditions, now let's talk about the temperatures that the CPU ran at and the power draw. The TDP, as stated on the box, is exactly the same as the 7800X3D. However, real-world power draw of the new CPU is much higher. Under full load, the 9800X3D was up at 151 watts, with totally stock settings on the motherboard, apart from Expo enabled for the memory. So the max temperatures I saw at stock on the 9800X3D were 87 degrees C. This made it 58% hotter at stock than 9700X and 14% hotter at stock than the 7800X3D. More energy and more temperature. Like we just said, 14% more temperature, 71% more power draw. And does this power draw and uh, temperature actually equate into performance? Well, let's have a look at our benchmark results. And as per usual, I won't be doing all that gaming, blah, blah, blah stuff that you like guys request. I do what 8-pack wants. All right. So what results did we get when testing this CPU at stock versus a 9700X and versus a 7800X3D? The graphs of the results are going to be on the screen now, but I'm also going to read out a few relevant scores. So in our OC UK Blender test, uh, this particular CPU took 1 hour 42 minutes, which is an 11% improvement over the 9700X and a full 50% generational leap on the 7800X3D. So this is already telling me that the new CPU is absolutely fabulous at multi-core when you compare it to the previous gen. So not only really is it a gamer CPU, actually it's a very solid multi-core CPU with, with all eight cores uh, doing a really good job when faced with multi-core workloads. 3D Mark Five Strike Graphics, uh, which we scored 82,317, was a 0.61% improvement over the 9700X and 0.64% improvement over the 7800X3D. The 3D Mark CPU profile, we had an 8.8% improvement over the 9700X and a whole 19.4% improvement over the 7800X3D. Again, carrying on the multi-core uh, proficiency that we've seen on this CPU. In terms of Cinebench R23 Multicore, we had an 11.5% improvement over the 9700X and we had a 19.4% improvement over the 7800X3D. In R23 Single Core, we had a 6.6% .6 reduction versus the 9700X, but a 12.4% improvement of the 7800X3D. In Cinebench Multicore, the R24 this time, we had an 11.8% improvement over the 9700X and a 17.8% improvement over the 7800X3D. Superposition, which is more of a gaming benchmark per se, we saw a 6.1% improvement over the 9700X and a 15.8% improvement over the 7800X3D. Again, a really solid result in a gaming-based benchmark. On Final Fantasy benchmark, which was running uh, 1080p, but fairly high graphical settings, we saw a 0.4% improvement over the 9700X uh, and a 0.3% improvement over the 7800X3D. Now I can only summarize really that those improvements were so small because the because of the level of detail I was running was actually shifting the bottleneck of the benchmark over the, the GPU. And I think we'll probably see that as we move through uh, even more uh, high overclock and PBO testing benchmarks, that that benchmark doesn't seem to do much no matter what you throw at it CPU-wise. But of course, we'll look through the results in a little bit. In terms of Unigen Valley, we saw a 2.3% reduction versus 9700X, but a 21% improvement generation on generation versus 7800X3D. And finally, in Unigen Heaven, which again was at 1080p with kind of medium uh, detail settings, we saw a 2.14% improvement uh, versus the 9700X and a 16.8% improvement versus 7800X3D. 
So overall, given the peaks and troughs of the new CPU, we saw an 11% improvement uh, versus the 7800X3D or the previous generation, which is a very solid uh, generational leap. And it's a little bit more of a generational leap when you're comparing the 3D cache version versus the non-3D cache version. So what I mean is we already covered in my videos like 9900X versus 7900X and found roughly it was 9.8 to 10% better generation to generation with a 3D cache CPU, we're seeing that um, it's actually more than that, closer to 11% or even pushing up to 12% or even higher on some multi-threaded benchmarks. So well done to AMD for, for making these generational leaps. Obviously, as I've explained in a, a few of the benchmarks, it, the CPU doesn't seem to quite improve as well as maybe you would expect when you're comparing to say the 9700X. But we can only speculate in those benchmarks that maybe the, the, it's the GPU that's probably causing the bottleneck rather than the CPU. And, and it really is those benchmarks that are low resolution, medium detail that's affecting uh, those kind of scores. So. All that, of course, is stock settings, completely stock bias. Let's see how we can now improve the CPU with some PBO2 tuning, some overclocking, and some memory overclocking and tuning. Okay, so what were the overclocking results? Manual overclocking uh, and PBO2. Right, firstly, let's say that PBO2 overclocking on this particular CPU made no statistical difference at all across all the benchmarks with my uh, particular settings and with a few different settings I tried. Now, I'll be honest with you, I've only had this CPU two to three days before making this video. So there is really a lot more to be done with BBO2. And I didn't have time to explore in great detail the negative curve offsets and so on and so on. But what I did do was I had a negative voltage offset. I did have a negative curve of about minus 15. I set the limits of the CPU uh, to coincide with the motherboard itself uh, and I had a scaling factor of about X5 and, and the memory at 5200 megahertz expo I noticed no difference over stock. Uh, but I guess uh, if you do uh, spend time tweaking this you will you will make gains but for me more gains were made in the static overclocking so we're going to talk more now about static overclocking with the memory first at 5200 megahertz and then with tuned memory. So with manual overclocking, I was able to make this particular uh, CPU uh, run very stably, rock stable for everything I ran uh, at 5.35 gigahertz, all cores, and it would do every single test running at 5.3 gigahertz with, with no issues whatsoever. This uh, led to uh, a top temperature scene of 90 degrees C on our one hour plus, well in this particular CPU's case, one hour 30 plus OCUK uh, blender test. Uh, and that particular test do 155 watts at 5.35 gigahertz on all cores. So basically what we had with this is 2.5% more power draw to get the extra performance with temperatures still being uh, very good. I think we're, from stock we've only added uh, four to five degrees on. And in fact, from stock we've only added uh, four watts of actual power draw by maintaining our top clock frequency all the time. So that being said, what were our actual results for this overclocking? In our blender test, we saw a 3.5% uh, improvement over stock. Uh, in our 3D Mark Fire Strike physics test, we saw a 3% improvement in overstock. Uh, CPU profile for 3D Mark was 4.9 overstock. Uh, time Spike Extreme was 4.9% overstock. Cinebench with 5% improvement. Cinebench R24 was 2.8% improvement. Final Fantasy, strangely enough, was a 1% reduction, but of course we did discuss this uh, particular benchmark in our uh, stock uh, review of the scores and said this is probably uh, more GPU limited uh, than anything else. And maybe it's something I should re remove actually from my uh, CPU reviews in future. Superposition, we saw a 3.35% improvement over stock. Unigen Valley was a 3% improvement and Unigen Heaven was a 2.9% improvement. So overall, basically overclocking this CPU on a 240, millimeter cooler with a memory at 5200 megahertz saw a 3.2 percent improvement in uh, performance which was actually not too bad at all when you think all you're sacrificing is four degrees in terms of temperature and four watts in terms of power so certainly static overclocking is worth doing and if you compare this uh, x2d result versus the previous generation we're now up to a full 15 percent of improvement versus our uh, X3D uh, 7800 CPU. 
So after this overclocking testing at 5.35 gigahertz, I decided to keep the CPU at 5.53 gigahertz and now overclock the memory. So we moved the memory from 5200 megahertz all the way up to 6000 megahertz. And with the 6000 megahertz memory, the G-Skill 6 uh, I have next to me here, we also tuned the timings with a very similar profile that uh, was working reasonably strongly for us, around 3% improvement to 4% improvement on the 9950X and the 9900X, which I reviewed earlier. So I used uh, pretty much those uh, exact settings. Now what I did see uh, in my benchmarks is uh, an improved results, as you can see on the screen now. But the improvement in result across my suite of benchmarks was nowhere near as much as I saw with the 9950X or the 9900X in my testing. Uh, in fact, the maximum gain I saw in these particular benchmarks was 1.3%, whereas with the other CPUs non-3D within this generation, I saw like up to 5% improvement by just tuning memory. Now I can only uh, really summarize that this 1.3% improvement is because uh, of the uh, level of of L3 cache we've got here, uh, and that the memory bandwidth is not really been taken uh, full advantage of, of this by this particular CPU. Now I'm sure if you really pick specific benchmarks that like memory bandwidth and force memory bandwidth to be, uh, you know, if you like a prime bottleneck, something like uh, Abacus or Optistruct or some of these uh, finite element analysis uh, programs or some of these simulation type things such as MATLAB, then the improvement will be more. But for me, uh, on my benchmarking suite that I've been consistent with, literally the best stock I could get was 1.3%. I mean, it's still an improvement and it pushes our generational leap up towards 15% when you compare to the 7800X3D, but you'll have to weigh off whether you wanna spend time tuning your memory uh, to, to get such what is relatively a small increase in performance. So, I really do like the CPU, and as is customary, anything I like, I make bundles. Uh, or hardware upgrade bundles for that particular CPU. So for this CPU, yes, I will be making uh, bundles which come with motherboard, uh, thermal paste, memory, tuned memory, all the settings that we've described here in the overclocking embedded in the BIOS. So they're literally plug and play. And obviously they all come with uh, AIO coolers. If you're interested in any of my bundles, click on the links in the description below. So in conclusion, it's now the king of gaming, and it's pretty easy to say that. And not like the previous generation CPU, which was a very good gamer, but pretty lame on multi-threading. This CPU is actually spectacular, very good on multi-threading. Tests like Blender now, it can really compete with the non-3D cache version at a similar clock speed. And in fact, in some multi-threaded tests, it actually beats the current gen uh, CPU in multi-threading. So it's better for gaming and as good for multi-threading. And I really do approve and like this CPU, as you can tell by, uh, by me introducing three bundles aimed at the customer who would particularly buy the CPU. Also, this particular CPU now has a lot of tuning, which the previous gen CPU didn't have, which I do like. It has PBO2 tuning, which obviously I didn't manage to do much on that with extracting extra performance, but you, the end user, can test a little bit more. And I'm sure in future, I will actually get more time with the CPU and more time with the platform to try and push that a bit further. But obviously it has good static overclocking, uh, keeping the CPU also at good temperatures. It has uh, good memory overclocking, good memory tuning, with the sweet spot for memory still being around the 6,000 megahertz mark. Uh, and also it's good for the tinker in that. And at the same time, it's not pointing out a crazy amount of heat. So you can use a 240 millimeter AIO quite easily, which opens up the usage of a lot more cases than when you need a 360 millimeter uh, cooler or even custom water cooling. And finally, as always, and what's custom for me now. Please do not like the video. Certainly do not like our socials, or my socials, or anything to do with overclockers in fact. But do of course, check out all my other 9000 series by AMD CPU reviews, which are, I'll be honest, the best on YouTube.